Good evening. You're listening to Wide Awake News on Monday, December 16th, 2013. My name is Gary Hendershot, and for the next hour, I will be barking at the moon, whether it's up there tonight or not. A little bit more on that later. You know, there, there's been this thing going on in the Ukraine for a little while now, and I've kind of been, you know, taking a step back from it, because, you know, we, we've we seen these off-the-wall so-called revolutions going on all over the Middle East, you know, it's been referred to as the Arab Spring, although I'm not sure whether they're springing into something or springing out of something, I just really don't know, it's hard to say. Um, and now we're seeing some pretty wild and crazy protests going on in the Ukraine. They're kind of hard to pin down. I mean, it, you got to understand, Ukraine is kind of kind of like the United States. You know, in the United States, you got the righteous people who live in in, in the southern states, and, and then you got those other folks that live up north. And we got this, you know, line of demarcation called the the, the Mason-Dixon line, and uh, you know we we had ourselves a little war of northern aggression, you know, about a hundred and some odd years ago, and uh, you know that was really kind of the start of our troubles. Well, Ukraine is kind of similar in many ways. They got a line of demarcation that kind of divides them east and west, and the western portion of Ukraine kind of identifies with um, with Europe. The eastern portion of the Ukraine, historically, kind of identifies with the old Soviet system, Russia, if you will. As a matter of fact, many of the uh, Ukrainians who live in the eastern portion of the country um, are Russian by heritage. Well, ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, um, Ukraine's kind of been on the seesaw. You just didn't know which way they were going to fall. You know, there's some in the Ukraine who seem to think it would be a really, really good idea to, you know, hook their wagon up to the Euro and become a member of the European Union and, you know, press on in, uh, in lockstep with Europe. Others in the Ukraine remember fondly. I know it's hard for us to believe, but they remember fondly uh, the old Soviet era, and they'd kind of like to hook up with the Russians. Well, the protests that have been going on right now in the Ukraine seem to be spearheaded by the folks who want to get tied up with the Europeans. Now, in an article by Paul Craig Roberts, and you know, I, I don't agree with Paul Craig Roberts on everything, but, you know, he makes some very good arguments. You know, he, he obviously understands the regional differences that divide that nation. He obviously has some sensitivity to it. But, you know, he is a little hard on the uh, current round of protesters, and he basically makes the argument that, you know, this is something that's backed by the CIA, that, uh, uh, that you know, these protests like the ones that started in Libya, went through Tunisia, and on into Egypt, and so on, that these are, you know, basically uh, divide-and-conquer routines financed by... U.S. CIA and other related interests, 
in an attempt to pry the UK, Ukraine um, away from Russia's sphere of influence. He may be right. His argument is very convincing. Now, one of the things Paul Craig Roberts cautions the Ukrainians about is, you know, before you decide to hook up with these fellows in Europe, you know, you, you might want to take a look at what's happened to Latvia, Greece, Spain, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, where promises of instant prosperity because of your attachment to Europe, your acceptance of the Europe, the Euro, and becoming a full-fledged member of the European Union, uh, seems to come with a pretty heavy price tag attached that may, in many ways, be more abusive than what Western interests would consider the abuses under the Soviet system. So this is something to kind of consider. Uh, one thing that's happened recently is that, you know, lobbying has started, you know, and, and most recently, uh, you know, Fireball McCain, I, uh, John Senator, uh, John McCain uh, actually made an appearance uh, in Kiev to make an argument telling those Ukrainian police that, you know, you ought to be, you ought to be respectful of those, uh, those protesters out there who are protesting in favor of joining the European Union. But if any of those fellows get out there in the street and start yelling and screaming about joining up with Russia, you can kick their ass. That's okay. You can do just like we do here in the United States. You, know, you can pepper gas them, you can taser them, you can beat them with batons, you can do whatever they want. If they come out wanting to join up with Russia, you go ahead, you man. You, you just kick their ass. But, you know, uh, these other fellows over here, these ones who want to join up with the European Union, uh, you, you should be treating them with kid gloves. And frankly, so far, the Ukrainian police have been very subdued. Uh, there were some early incidents that were a bit embarrassing, but overall, considering the level of provocation, um, I kind of wish that our cops would go take training from the folks in the Ukraine rather than going over to Israel and getting their crowd control training from those boys, because it seems the Ukrainians have a, a, a very reasonable approach to handling these protesters. Right now, in Kiev, there are two factions. There is one faction that is protesting vigorously in favor of joining up with the, uh, with the, with the European Union, and there is another group protesting in favor of the current government in the Ukraine or to join up with the Russians, and they are only separated by a thin line of riot police and their own self-built barricades. How's it all going to play out? Hard to say. Uh, that American dollar is very tempting, and the United States does have a way of buying whatever influence it requires to see its interests put forward. So we'll just have to see. On to other interesting items here. Did you hear what uh, our President Obama had to say about all the NSA spying? Did you hear what he had to say about it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the first reports that came out is he said, oh, look, it's just, a, you know, it's all just media hype. It never really happened. You know, y'all go back to sleep now. Ain't nothing to see here. Ain't no big deal. And then under pressure, he said, oh, oh all right, you know, I'll, uh, I'll look into it, and I will definitely, you know, rein these guys in. Mm hmm mm hmm That was back in, you know, August. He said, okay, yeah, 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 well, you know, nothing happened. Well, now he's come out and said, we're going to make reforms to the NSA spying program. Now, the article I'm reading from here is from Washington's blog. Uh, kind of like that guy, you know. I, again, you know, I don't agree with everything he has to say, 
But, you know, he makes some darn cogent arguments that are worthy of consideration. You know, if you're ever bored and looking for something interesting to read, you might just wander over there and take a look at some of his musings, because some of it, very reasonable. The writer asks, should we believe Obama? He says, oh, I'm going to rein in this, this, you know, this uh, uh, NSA spying nonsense. You know, we're, we're going to get that under control. We're going to make some reforms. Well, the problem is, it is patently illegal for the NSA to spy on Americans. But now, there's nothing illegal about the NSA spying on the Australians, the Germans, and the Brits. Well, that's perfectly reasonable. And if the NSA happened to have technology that helped you spy better, and they gave it to the Aussies and the Brits and the Germans, and then under contract, we provide spy information on the Aussies and the Brits and the Germans to those governments, and we hire them to spy on the American people, and they give intelligence on American people to us. That's perfectly legal. That is how contorted these sons of bitches think. Okay? You write a rule that you think is hard and fast. Thou shalt not. Okay? It's one of the big ones. You know, it's like down from God. You will not do this. These boys don't say, oh, okay, well, we just won't do that because, you know, that's bad. We're not going to do that. That's un-American. No, no. The way these guys think is they go in the back room and they just start sweating. Huh, how are we going to get away with this? You know, well, what angle can we use? How can we get around it? You know, I know. We'll cut a deal with some of our buddies. We'll do for them what they can't do under their laws. They do for us what we can't do under our laws. Everybody's happy. Everybody wins. It's a win-win scenario. This is a great thing, right? Right? That's the game that's being played on you. What do you think? You happy with that? I'd like you to stop and think about that kind of logic. Consider and make up your own damn mind. Now, where the heck is our Congress in all this, okay? You know, we elect these guys. They're supposed to be our representatives. They're supposed to represent our interests, right? Right? That's the way it was supposed to work. Suppose I told you <laughs> that, uh, and this article's from, uh, from Russia Today. Again, you've got to consider the source. I mean, Russia Today obviously has their slant on things. You can never, you know, but still, consider the argument. And as always, make up your own damn mind. You're supposed to be an adult. But, you know, in a study published by a fellow named uh, Donnie Shaw, I don't know this guy. I don't know what his qualifications are, but, you know, a nonpartisan research organization called Maplite. I don't know what acts these guys got to grind. But, you know, they've explored the connections between major industry players that provide the intelligence community with services, you know, like the spy gear and the computers and the snooping software and all that, you know, the the contractors. What is their relationship to our elected officials? Be interesting information, wouldn't it? Hmm. Seventy percent of the intelligence budget is used to pay these private contractors. So if you know if you're on the short list, you know it guaranteed money. You're going to do well. Suppose I told you that according to research published this week by Shaw, 
PACs and individuals from the top 20 contractors with ties to the Pentagon have all contributed significantly, significantly, with a capital S, to members of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Would that surprise you? Would that surprise you? Uh, with regards to controversies, uh, in total, members of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence have received $3.7 million from top intelligence service contractors since January 2005. Huh. So not only are these guys being paid off, but they can be bought cheap because these intelligence contracts, you know, these, things, these are billion dollar contracts. Billion with a capital B. These are billion dollar contracts. Now, if all you got to do is shake loose a couple million to buy off the panel to make sure that, you know, you're treading lightly on the laws is just ignored. Sounds like a bargain to me, doesn't it? Wouldn't you take such a deal? And how is that money divided up? The Maplite research reveals that Representative Dutch Rupersberger, Rupersberger, Democrat from Maryland, the chairman of the House Committee, who also represents the district containing NSA headquarters, is the largest recipient of intelligence contractor money reaping in around 363000 since 2005. So, bottom line is, you know, we got the best government money can buy. If you want to buy one of these guys, looks like all you got to do is be prepared to, you know, toss them somewhere in the neighborhood of 70, 80, 90 grand a year. And you too can get preferential treatment anytime you're hauled up for an investigation. For some of these big companies where there are million and billion dollar contracts, uh, being awarded? That's chump change. That's chump change. And you're looking at the panel of chumps. And they're making all of us look like chumps. Yeah, I'm almost getting bored talking about Obamacare. See, that's a problem when you got information overload. Okay? It comes at you so fast and from so many different directions that sometimes, you know, you just want to, yeah, please, give me some good news. Let me watch the Cartoon Network for a little bit here, you know, forget some of this nonsense. But, you know, this Obamacare thing is, is like a you know, a runaway freight train that nobody seems to be able to get under control. Nobody seems to be able to stop it. Nobody seems to be able to steer it. I mean, it is just running headlong, and, it, and it's out of control. Hmm. The Obamacare nightmare continues. This is from the Daily Sheeple. Now, again, you know, these, these fellows have their bias, just like everybody else. And, you know, you got to remember that this guy is writing an editorial. This is a blog. This is his opinion. You know, he is stating his opinion as clearly and with as much supporting evidence as he can muster with all of these things. Yeah, that's what so many forget nowadays, you know. They, uh, they hear me on, uh, on Rents Radio or they see me on YouTube and they think, oh, well, you know, he, he's a talking head. He must know what he's talking about. Yeah, here, here, he writes a blog, you know. He, he knows how to read and write. You know, he must know what he's talking about. What well, guy there, you know, he's got a bullhorn, and he, he's, he's bullhorn in the Federal Reserve. He must know what he's talking about. If there's one message you come away with from watching me bark at the moon, it's just that. All I'm doing is barking at the moon. I don't know any more about these items than you do. And frankly, neither do the rest of them. 
See, what an adult does, what a thinking adult does, is they consider arguments. Everybody's got their bone to pick. Everybody's got their point of view. Everybody's got their spin. Everybody's got their agenda. It's up to you to consider the various arguments. And really, you should be taking in arguments from as many sources as you can find. Don't assume that any of them have any special insight. Because the bottom line is, it's up to you to make up your own damn mind what is and is not the facts. But on this Obamacare, well, we'll have to get back to it uh, after the break. I'm hearing the music in the background here, so I'm going to have to slide out of here long enough to sell a few products, try to make enough money to keep the lights burning at the network. I'll be right back. And we're back from that blatant commercial interruption. And I hope you paid much attention to all those uh, product announcements, because I'll tell you what, it's... Uh, those fellows who keep the lights burning. Back to my uh, hot topic of the evening. You know, there, there, were, there, there was one argument I wanted to make sure we all understand. Uh, I have no special knowledge of any of these things. And frankly, most of the writers whose articles I'm considering, uh, they don't really have any special knowledge either. They're looking at the facts. They're formulating an opinion and they're presenting their opinion to you for your consideration. But this is what this fellow over at, uh, actually it's a young lady named Lily Dane. This was uh, just published yesterday, a Sunday publication. Uh, nearly half of those with job-based or other private coverage say their policies will be changing next year. Nearly half. Nearly half of those. Okay, so you go to work for an outfit, you negotiate the best deal you can, and part of your compensation is a health care package. You think you negotiated a deal. You think it's locked in stone. You signed an employment agreement or you shook hands or whatever. You think you made a deal. And the government sticks its nose in there and decides that the health care plan that your employer offers is not quite up to what the government considers appropriate. So an uninvolved third party changes the deal you made with your employer. In the case of union workers, workers have joined together. They've formed a union. Union negotiates with the management and says, okay, these are the benefits that you will provide under your contract with the union. We will provide labor. You will provide these benefits. It's a deal, right? <sighs> Not in America in the 21st century. Nearly half of those with job-based or other private coverage say their policies will be changing next year, mostly for the worse. 69% say their premiums will be going up. That's affordable. I mean, this thing was called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act when it was run up the flagpole for everybody to salute. 69% say their premiums will be going up. Hmm. While 59% say annual deductibles or co-payments will be increased. Okay, so... Let me see if I understand this correctly. This here Affordable Care Act means I got to pay more every month for the coverage. The coverage is reduced. And if I have to make a claim, I got to pay more of a deductible or more of a copay. And that is what they refer to as affordable. Interesting. Only 21% of those with private coverage said their plan is expanding to cover more types of medical care, though coverage of 
preventative care at no charge to the patient has been required by the law for the past couple of years. <laughs> 14% said coverage for spouses is being restricted or eliminated. And 11% said their plan is being discontinued. Hmm. Disapproval of Obama's handling of health care topped 60% in the poll. I'm not sure how many of you have gone to the website and tried to sign up and, you know, gone through their volumes and volumes of information that they want to collect on you. And frankly, from what I understand, I have not gone through the exercise yet, so I cannot say personally. But reports I've heard back is that uh, they want a heck of a lot more information than what you would normally have to fill out uh, to get a, a health care plan. I mean, you know, back in the good old days, like last year, you know, if you went in and tried to get a health care plan, you know, they they probably want, you know, a guy my age, you know, they'd probably want to run some kind of a, a, a physical exam on me to see if they could find any, you know, pre-existing things that they could exclude from the list of what's covered. You know, they'd want to do something like that, you know, because I'm an old geezer. And, you know, they, they want a young fellow who's, you know, in his 20s or 30s, you know, they probably just sign him right up. You know, no health exam, no nothing. You know, are you breathing? Can you pay the premium? Sign here. Boom, you're done. All right. Nowadays, you got to give them all sorts of stuff. You know, it's, it's worse than filling out a mortgage. It's worse than filling out your taxes. I mean, they want to know everything. One of the things they want to know about is they want to know about your banking relationships. They want to know where you're banking. They want to know where you're keeping your money. That's what Sharon Bruner found out. Indianola. Indianola. I'm not sure where the heck Indianola is. But Sharon Bruner of Indianola logged on to her checking account on Monday morning. This was last Monday. And found she was almost $800 light. The first thing was, first thing she thought, thought she said, I got screwed. You know, somebody tapped my account. Well, the Bruners enrolled for insurance on the Health Plan Finder, Washington State. Okay, so this is Indianola in Washington State. The Bruners enrolled for insurance on the Washington Health Plan Finder website last October. They say they selected the bill pay date to be December 24th. So she was expecting to get billed right at Christmas. Instead, the Washington... Health Plan Finder drafted the $835 premium last Monday. Interesting. The husband, Josh Bruner, started his own business this year as an engineer, re engineering recruiter. He, they said it's forced them to pay a lot of attention to their bills and their bank accounts. I, uh, having been uh, unemployed for 37 years myself, I can understand that. You know, you, you got to keep a close watch on the on the pennies when you're self-employed big knot in my gut because we're trying to keep it together says Sharon Bruner it's important to me that this kind of stuff doesn't happen basically what they got is they're living paycheck to paycheck they were counting on that paycheck for the first of the month to pay the rent and whatever else they got to pay out of that check they're counting on the second half of the month paycheck to pay that insurance plan and contrary to their instructions that they left on the website the money got tapped a little earlier than what they would have assumed. Left them short. What do you think of that? Suppose that happened to you. How would you feel? I think I'm coming up on the next break here in about a minute, but I'm going to try and get through part of this next piece here. Another Obamacare deadline was pushed back on Thursday, and now the White House is asking for insurers to accept late payments and still give individuals coverage in the interim. Basically, you know, they've, they've met a, they've, they have missed yet another one of their deadlines. Uh, let's see. This article's from uh, a lady named Kate Rogers. 
See, the administration needs this law to work. Under the Affordable Care Act, the enrollment requirement had previously been that individuals had to enroll in the plan by the 15th of the month in order to have the coverage kick in by the first of the month. It's been pushed back to the 31st. The latest pushback also comes after a glitch that was confirmed last week that the back-end mechanism that allows the government to pay insurers for subsidized and cost-sharing plans has not even been built yet. I'm telling you, this Affordable Care Act, yeah, they'd be putting a lipstick on a pig. All right, I am hearing the music. It's time for me to bail out of here for a couple minutes while I sell some more products. This will be the last break for the evening, and I'll be back in just a moment. All righty, uh, we're back from our second break of the evening. And uh, let's see, I've still got a few more items. I, I don't think I'm going to get to the, the article on the tapering and a, and a couple of the economic issues that I kind of wanted to cover tonight. Because I, I tell you, in this last segment, in, in the beginning, I know I hit you with all kinds of, you know, oh, man, Hendershot, you're a doggy downer. Why are you talking all that down stuff? You know, so in this last segment of the show, Try to bring out some material. It's a little uplifting, so I can leave you with a little bit of a smile on your face. I'm, I'm sure Harris, who comes on after me, he'll have something that's a doggy downer to get you back into the depression session. But that's okay. You know, we're, we're going to try and give you a little bit of uplifting news at this point of the evening. Now, how about them Chinese? Uh huh. You know, the guys we kind of love to hate. You know, right now we're yeah, kind of you know going toe to toe with them over you know off some islands that uh, are under dispute between the Japanese and the China and the Chinese you know and obviously we're gonna back our buddies the Japanese you know and a lot of people look at that one saying holy cow you know that, that that could go thermonuclear real quick if everybody doesn't keep their heads about them but you know this week we should be congratulating the Chinese because, uh, you know, while they may be going not where no man has gone before, they are going where no man's been for about 30 years, okay? They've put a little rover, <laughs> which is a dead ringer for some little critters we got running around on Mars, but that's okay, you know. They have put a rover on the surface of the moon, uh, a considerable technological challenge and an achievement that we should be congratulating the Chinese for. I know, there's some of the, oh yeah, well, you know, we, we had guys in spacesuits playing golf up there, man. We already planted the flag. We're so cool. Yeah, okay. Fact is, though, we ain't been back in 30 years. And right now, we got to hitch a ride to the space station with the Russians. The Chinese have a very active, very aggressive space program. And they're making all the necessary moves to be the first human beings back to the moon since we gave up the territory. Now, this little lander, uh, the mission is called the Chang'e, Chang'e 3. I hope I said that right. You know, I, with a southern accent, it's, it's hard to put a Chinese emphasis on something. And it's a typical two-part gizmo. You know, they got a lander, and then the lander puts off a little rover. Now, on the lander, they've got an optical ultraviolet telescope for astronomy. They've got an ultraviolet camera used to monitor space weather. On the little rover guy, they've got two panoramic cameras, full color, They've got engineering and navigation cameras. Frankly, I have no idea what that does. They've got an arm-mounted alpha particle x-ray spectrometer. Well, that's a mouthful. To analyze chemical elements in the rocks and soil. That's cool. Okay. Uh, infrared spectrometer to study minerals. And this sucker's got a ground-penetrating radar to map the structure of lunar soil and crust down to several hundred feet. Pretty smart little gizmo. Now, obviously, 
this lunar landing was a practice run for what the Chinese are claiming is their intent to put men on the moon. They are hell-bent on getting there. I said, go for it. Would be nice to see some real honest-to-God color images of the moon instead of those uh, washed-out, grainy, photoshopped jobs our guys brought back. Uh, maybe the Chinese, maybe their cameras will actually work as advertised. Maybe they bought their cameras from the Japanese and they're actually of decent quality. I, something must have been wrong with those Hasselblads they were using back in the 60s and 70s. Best cameras in the world. Oh, well. The lander and rover photographed each other Sunday evening. The Chinese craft performed the first soft landing, non-crash landing, on the moon since 1976. And Jade Rabbit, or U-2, almost sounds like U-2, but it's U-2, is the first rover mission since the Soviet Union's Lukahod-2 trundled through the gray soil 40 years ago. Congratulations to the Chinese. It's a hell of an achievement. I hope they bring back some interesting science. We are moving very quickly toward that ho-ho-ho Christmas season. And I can tell you that even since I was a kid, the complexion of Christmas has changed significantly. I, mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, working for weeks to make that really cool thing to give my mom, that really cool thing, you know, you know we, we made things, you know, we, we made crafts, and that's what we exchanged as, as gifts, so, you know, it was something special, something that we created. I don't know, when I was a young preteen, I guess, you know, finally evolved to the point where you know that was just too much trouble. You know, took too much time. So you know, a week or so before Christmas, mom and dad would take us all to the mall. You know, and they give each me and my brothers. You know, they give us each five bucks, and they say, "Okay, you know, go find something. You know, that you think is a cool present." You know, okay. Back in those days, you could actually get some pretty cool presents for five bucks. You know, if you were a young kid with five bucks, you know, looking for some cool toy to get for your brothers, uh, you know, five bucks went a long way. But it seems year after year, the gifts had to be more and more expensive. And boy, if somebody gave you a gift and you didn't give them one, ooh, you know, you were embarrassed. And if, if you didn't give them a gift that was at least as expensive, you know, you're like keeping score. Oh, he gave me something that was almost worth a hundred bucks, and I only gave him something that was worth twenty-five. He's going to think I'm a cheapskate. You know, so there's this tendency to overcompensate. And, oh, you know, and I, I guess for the business community, this is all a good thing because they're kind of counting on that Christmas selling season to make their numbers for the year. They they really need those consumers out there maxing out their credit cards to make sure that you know they can stay in business for another year. So I I guess you know that's the justification for it. But there is a downside that we all need to be aware of. Our penchant for consumer gadgets and gizmos is becoming ridiculous. The landfills of the world are becoming overwhelmed with our cast-off electronics junk. That nifty pad or, or, or computer or monitor or TV or mini fridge or, or coffee maker or, or microwave, or that, that nifty gizmo that is just so cool coming out of the box on Christmas Eve this year is going to find its way to a landfill probably in just two years. That's the average. Two years. If you're a cheapskate like me, five years. But still, 
it's going to find a home in a landfill somewhere in the world. Ah. The world produces nearly 48.9 million tons of waste electronic gizmos every year. That works out to an average of 15 pounds of electronic gizmo scrap per person across the globe. And of course, the United States is well above the average. This year, when you're thinking about a gift that you want to give somebody, Keep that in mind that as cool as it might be this year, I know it's, it's the rage this year to have an iPad or, or some kind of gizmo, you know, some nifty electronic gizmo is the hot item this year. Keep in mind that that's going to be in the trash pile in just a few years and think about how much you're contributing to that mess, it is a, a, a real problem. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here kind of tongue-in-cheek, making it sound a little bit funny because you know, I'm trying to entertain as well as inform, but it is serious. It is serious because a lot of this stuff, it just doesn't degrade back into the soil like some of the other stuff we, you know, the stuff we used to make out of wood and clay and Things like that, you know, when people got bored with that and threw it in the trash pile, it was gone in fairly short order. Some of this electronics waste, it'll be around when human beings have long since gone extinct. There is a budget deal. Did you hear? They're not going to shut down the government first of the year. How about that? Should we all stand up and cheer? The bipartisan budget, budget deal passed by the U.S. House of Representatives Thursday as expected to be passed by the Senate next week constitutes a pact between Obama administration and Congress basically to attack the American working class. They're going to balance the budget on your back and particularly the backs of our veterans. They're the big ones that are taking the hit. And across the United States, it appears that about 1.4 million people for this Christmas are going to find out that their uninsurance, their unemployment insurance compensation will not be renewed. That's the budget deal. But guess what? We found enough money to give Israel three times the huge amount that Obama wanted to give them. Congress somehow found a way to give Israel three times what Obama wanted them to. But you veterans out there, your benefits are just a little too expensive. And those of you who are unemployed, maybe we'll find a new refrigerator box for you to use for Christmas. Hey, that's it. I'm done barking at the moon for this week. Y'all have a good week, and uh, I'll be back again next week to bark at the moon some more. Good night.